Welcome to this discussion on cells and tissues appropriate for the paramedic student as an introductory lesson for the human body section of paramedic school. There's no requirement of being an EMT or EMT level knowledge to take this course and understand it. You'll also find a lot of information here is just introductory so we can get started on other topics later on. My name is Sean Haverson and you can follow me on Instagram and Twitter with the handle at EMS Guru. You can also follow me on SoundCloud at EMS-Guru for future podcast production. And right here on YouTube, you can follow us, share, like, and subscribe. Our major objectives here and goals are to get a very cursory level knowledge of cells, their structures, and how those structures lead to differentiation of cell types, the different types of tissue and how tissues are specialized to create organs, how organs develop organ systems, and a review of the organ systems of the body and their major functions. This won't be a very in-depth review on most of this concept because we will review those individual pieces when we discuss individual organ systems, anatomy, physiology, and their pathophysiology. So why go into such detail? Paramedic students often wonder to themselves, why is it that we're going to spend so much time talking about cells and chemistry, when in all reality, we focus on things that we can see in the pre-hospital setting, things like the patient condition and how to treat the patient. Very rarely are we thinking about the cells and the tissue at hand. I guess that's a little bit of an oversimplification of what we actually do. And in fact, it's very important that we understand how cells work, how the chemistry influences the cells, how they should normally function, how they dysfunction, and how our medicine impacts cells. Now, it's true that on most emergencies, you're not specifically thinking about in your quick actions, what is this doing to cells necessarily, but a very strong medic will understand what their treatment is doing and how this disease results in the outlying signs and symptoms based on that cellular function. So let's talk about a disease that maybe isn't seen very often, but when it is seen in EMS, it's generally a difficult patient to manage. So patients with cystic fibrosis have experienced a mutation in one of their genes in the development phase uh, as a child. And when they're born, they're born with this disorder. And the prognosis for this at one time was very difficult, in which most children died before six months of age, and there was no quality of life associated with it. Now with advances in identifying early and treating, many people that have cystic fibrosis will live on to their 40s and will have a quality of life that is greatly improved and maybe a little bit difficult because of their chronic illnesses, but still something that many cystic fibrosis patients have the ability to experience a wonderful life. The disease itself and its signs and symptoms and how it may present most commonly in EMS will probably involve one of these things. One of the hallmarks is that they have poor growth development, even though they'll be taking in enough nutrients. One other pathway is that the thick mucus production that develops will result in patients having frequent respiratory infections and perhaps even having problems with their GI tract and the mucus that's involved there and pancreas dysfunction, among other problems. In EMS, we're commonly called for one of those things, and when we're called, it's generally a true emergency. These are chronic patients that have medical care well beyond our levels, but they call when they've exhausted all of their resources. One of the more common calls is because of respiratory tract disease and infections that's really difficult to manage at the point that they've accessed EMS. In addition to the respiratory disease, they also have underlying malnutrition, GI symptoms that could involve liver disease or pancreas emergencies, including hypo and hyperglycemia, dehydration, heat intolerance, emergencies, and electrolyte dysfunctions. So here's where we get back to the point of the cells. If you understood how cells worked in general and then could extract from that, just knowing a little bit about the disease, you would follow some logical conclusions that would tell you about the disease itself. And in those conclusions, you would also find the clues to your treatment so that you can make very sound decisions in choosing to treat these patients as they present to you without having to reference very heavily the disease itself so the disease itself is genetic in origin is a mutation of the CFTR gene. And the CFTR gene in this mutation creates an abnormal channel that allows chloride ions to move in and out of cells in an uncoordinated manner. 
Something that we'll learn and that you may already know, especially if you're an AEMT or EMT intermediate, is that water follows salt in general. And chloride has an ability, when it moves in an imbalance, it moves in the improper way, to pull water out of the chambers where it should be and place it into other areas, or in many cases, outside of the body. Now, if you remember that water follows salt, sometimes we'll find that there won't be enough salt in mucus to allow water to go into the mucus to make it thin and manageable. Instead, the mucus becomes very, very thick and can trap things. That trapping can occur in the lungs in which air will be trapped and as well bacteria. And the incidence of respiratory infections increases in the patient with cystic fibrosis. On top of that, they've also decreased their ability to receive nutrients in the process, partly because of mucus production and partly because of their other qualities of their disease. So without these proper nutrients, they're unable to battle diseases and infections that the common person can battle. Even if you haven't experienced before as a presentation of emergency medicine, if you've memorized how this small change to the cell impacts the chemicals, the cells around it, the tissues, and then the organs, you'll be able to understand how you can manage them with very little outside knowledge. So the minutia can be important here. So this is all essentially to open the door so that we can better understand the disease processes and the normal function of the body, and not so that we can try and take a slide of a patient's cellular structure and view it in the microscope in the back of a truck. As you imagine, that wouldn't be successful nor preferential. So we would stay away from that, even if it were possible. So it just gives us enough knowledge in the background to support our endeavors. So let's talk about cells as our starting point for the discussion of life. Cells are the basic unit of life, and they have subunits and components that do give rise to life, like chemicals, atoms, molecules, and compounds that will come together to create the properties of cells. The cells will also interact with chemicals in such a way that chemicals can influence the cells, the tissue, and the organism to help or hinder life. When we're looking at cells, obviously we know that they're very small, however, their shape and size and function differs vastly in the human body. In all cells, there's going to be some similarities associated with them. Here we can see a picture of a cell as presented with common organelles within them. All of these organelles seen on the screen will cover in this discussion to a degree. These organelles can be thought of as essentially the workhorses or the factory with a specialization to do something inside of that cell. It's usually to maintain the cell's function and or to help with the cell when it undergoes cellular division, disease, or just to get the cell through day-to-day -day life. All cells have the basic properties uh, that we'll describe here. We're going to describe primarily human cells and not necessarily go into detail in this lecture in cells like bacterial cells and non-cellular structures like that of a virus. That will be discussed in a separate lecture that will cover essentially the pathology of disease and mechanisms of disease as they're commonly listed in EMS textbooks. The common composition of human cells includes this primary idea that we have separated through the use of chemistry, we've separated different sections of a fluid into compartments, and that compartmentalization itself gives rise to life. So what we want to think about is the fluid inside of the cell and the fluid that's outside of the cell. Now, right now, I'm only going to talk about interstitial fluid, but in fact, there are really three types of fluid compartments. There's the intracellular, as listed here. There's the interstitial fluid, which surrounds the intracellular. So interstitial surrounds the intercellular, intercellular. And bordering the interstitial will often be found intravascular, the one you probably have heard most about. Interstitial fluid is essentially not intracellular, and not intravascular. So it's essentially thought of as a third space or third fluid space. So interstitial fluid doesn't have the same composition as the cell has within its cytosol. Cytoplasm and cytosol, the fluid that's inside of the cell, has a composition of molecules that's made up differently than the outside environment of the cell. And just having this specialization to create compartments has brought rise to cells and eventually to life as proven by evolution. When we look at the basic composition of cells, it really all starts with that separation of compartments. And that can't be done without the physical barrier. The plasma membrane is that physical barrier. If we view the plasma membrane and use some of the tools we've used in other lectures, we can identify that these structures here, 
are pairs of phospholipids. The phospholipids fall within the lipid category, and as phospholipids, they have a head and a tail. And both the head and tail, although on the same molecule, have completely different properties. The head likes to be around water. It's happiest bathed in water. And the tail, it's phobic of water. It's afraid of water. It doesn't like to be embodied in water. And so when these phospholipids are organized together, they tend to bind together in a way that separates the water from the tail and allows the head to interact with the water, this keeping the cell separate in a barrier from the outside to the inside. In this space here, where we see the phospholipid bilayers tails all pointing at each other, there should not be water. If water was to make its way into this space, it would break apart the bond that keeps these things close together and would destroy the cell. So once the phospholipid bilayer is created, it's important that we have a means of keeping things like water or highly par charged particles from going through this space without some protection. That protection very often is going to be by structural proteins, and the structural por proteins will create pores in which water and electrolytes will flow through without actually touching this space. So it's really important to just think of this very basic chemical property of this molecule and how it creates our compartments and gives rise eventually to life. Here we can see the phospholipid bilayer and its embedded proteins and carbohydrates as well as lipids. So we can see that we've got our phospholipid bilayer with the blue head being the head that likes to be towards water, hydrophilic, and then we've got our tails separate from water, the hydrophobic tails. Embedded are going to be some cholesterols, as well as proteins, carbohydrates, and lipids that are all bound together to create big structures that may be uh, able to transmit a signal from outside the cell to inside the cell. And then we also have structural proteins that create the pores. This here is a channel that allows the things like water, or maybe even ionic material to go through the space of the phospholipid bilayer without actually touching the phospholipid bilayer's internal workings. That composition or separating the outside from the inside, again, the outside being the interstitial space and the inside being the cytoplasm or intracellular space, does give us different properties of chemicals inside that fluid or solution. So the cytoplasm really contains cytosol, and the cytosol with organelles makes up cytoplasm. The organelles, again, are the different factories that have very differentiated roles inside the cell's daily activities and cellular division roles. But here we identify that in the cytosol, we have different concentrations of very important ions, ions that we'll discuss throughout emergency medicine. So having these different concentrations allows for concentration gradients that will give rise to things like thought through electrical conduction, sending signals because you have received pain in your lower extremity and now you need to know what to do with that pain and perhaps move your leg. It will also send signals to our heart to allow it to beat efficiently and effectively and even to contract muscles among many other things. But if these were not separated, we could not have a concentration in the blood of 145 millimoles versus inside the cell of 12. The main organelles that we need to talk about involve the endoplasmic reticulum, also known very often as the ER, both in the smooth and rough form. Ribosomes, which are made up of probably, in our functions, RNA. The Golgi apparatus. Lysosomes, aka digestive bags. Mitochondria, the powerhouse, creating power. Centrioles, and the nucleus. So we'll first talk about the ribosomes. I start with the ribosomes because one of the most frequently referenced in emergency medicine disorders involving pH is the impact on things like hemoglobin made up of protein. So proteins, as we recall, just for a quick review, proteins are folded into different structures. We have primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary folding. And the protein gets more and more complex as it is folded towards quaternary. Now once folded, these proteins can do amazing things like hold the structure of a cell or tissue together or allow, as we mentioned before, proteins to pass through, ions to pass through, and water to pass through the phospholipid bilayer. 
In addition, proteins are going to be specialized in helping make our chemical reactions more efficient uh, and also happen in different circumstances, circumstances the chemical reaction would not normally happen in. The ribosomes are responsible for our protein synthesis. Protein synthesis is essentially the creation of proteins and then eventually perhaps adding them to something like our membrane. As as referenced earlier when we saw our functional protein in the form of a signal protein or a structural protein creating a pore through the phospholipid bilayer. So ribosomes are going to use the DNA code found inside the nucleus, translate it through RNA, and then eventually use that to tell it how to build its proteins. It will help create proteins that are in different folding structures. The ribosomes, given that they do this, are part of the endoplasmic reticulum, but very specifically, the rough endoplasmic reticulum. The rough in endoplasmic reticulum is from the ribosomes studying the outer walls of the endoplasmic reticulum. The endoplasmic reticulum where ribosomes exist are specifically designed for protein folding. We also have the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. In the smooth endoplasmic reticulum, we don't have ribosomes. That's why it has a smooth appearance and no longer a studded appearance, the smooth as we can see right here in this section. Now, this doesn't have protein involvement because there's not very many ribosomes located here, but it will help with lipid synthesis or the creation of different structural components made of fat molecules. The endoplasmic reticulum is a collection and starts from the outer edge of the nuclear membrane where DNA exists and moves outward into the cytosol from the center. The smooth endoplasmic reticulum is the outermost section as we can identify here. And it's important to note that because ribosomes are generally working with RNA and RNA trans transfers from the inside of the nuclear structure and envelope into our rough endoplasmic reticulum to allow for protein folding and structure. Protein can also be folded and attached to things like lipids and carbohydrates in further specialization after the initial protein folding has occurred. The Golgi apparatus is a further extension uh, to a degree of our endoplasmic reticulum. If we think of the endoplasmic reticulum as a factory in creating proteins or lipids, depending on which one we're talking about, then the Golgi apparatus is the factory's shipping and receiving center. And what will occur is proteins and lipids and proteins bound to lipids and other combinations of molecules will eventually make their way to the Golgi apparatus and be placed into these small round structures called vesicles. Vesicles are going to transfer that protein that was bound and prepared to the area where it's likely to work. Let's say, for instance, right here we had a protein that created a pore and a channel, but it broke, and we need to get a new protein to that site. The protein would be further specialized all the way through to the Golgi apparatus when it's ready for work. The Golgi apparatus will create a vesicle, will create a vesicle that will then transfer the protein to the plasma membrane where that section of damaged plasma membrane can be replaced. For instance, if we have a damaged receptor site for some type of chemical. I love all the organelles, but the one that I seem to come back to the most in emergency medicine and in relating diseases to treatment and diseases to our signs and symptoms is the mitochondria. The mitochondria is known as the power plant of the cell. So if we've got factories inside the cell, the factory is driven by the power plant. The mitochondria is going to contain some DNA that's going to code it and describe how mitochondria work. And in mitochondria doing their work, they're basically going to take a couple chemicals, including oxygen, glucose, and through a very complex process that I'm not giving much justice to, they're going to go through the process of metabolism. Metabolism then results, if we have the right components going into it, the product will be ATP. Adenosine triphosphate from the previous lecture you would identify as the powerhouse of the cell in package form. So the energy that's created by this powerhouse is packaged into ATP and then go goes and will do some form of work. Lysosomes are essentially our 
waste organism, organelle. And as a waste organelle, they're going to create, contain digestive enzymes. Now, not digestive in the sense that you and I think of, like, I need some digestive aiding with enzymes. So digestive in the idea that we're just breaking things down and not necessarily eating them. Because when we break things down to eat, we generally try to take food source out of it. In lysosomes, they're going to digest by breaking down for full destruction things that are broken, that need to be replaced and repaired, and sometimes even things that came from outside the cell and damaged the inside of the cell, like some invader. Now this term, lysosome, is important because the term lysis will come up for us a few different times in our lectures as EMT intermediates and paramedics. Lysis means destruction, so the cell breaking apart. And soma means the body. So the breaking apart of perhaps some structures of cell bodies can occur. The lysosome is thought of as the digestive bag because of that digestive enzyme. And they float around as essentially a vesicle that contains some chemical that will break down and aid in digestion of whatever it is that it's breaking down. Centrioles, or centrioles as they're pronounced in different ways, uh, are a set of pair organelles that will work primarily when we're working as a cell on cellular reproduction. They exist at in between cell reproduction and division as structures that are folded up and broken down and perhaps we could think of placed on the side for later. But what occurs when the cell goes through reproduction or cellular division is these organelles will start to extend themselves and create a framework that builds a matrix or a structure that allows for one cell to eventually split and become two cells. So the centrioles are essential in cellular division. Microvilli have a term that sometimes can be mixed with some of the other structures of our cell, and they're not necessarily pictured all here, or rather labeled here. So when we look at the outside of a cell, we can have some structures that are projections of the plasma membrane. Here we see the outside of a smooth section of the plasma membrane. And in this region, we see a section of the plasma membrane that has projections extending from it. So in this case, if we're looking at small finger-like extensions of the plasma membrane, those would be microvilli. Also sometimes confused with microvilli include the cilia, which we'll discuss on the next slide. Microvilli, their role is not necessarily the same as cilia, which they're commonly confused with. Microvilli are purely to increase the absorptive surface area of a cell. And so how do we do that? Let's think for a moment about the GI tract. We know that our GI tract, our intestines, are packed into our bellies, but if stretched from end to end would be very, very, very long. Now that end to end extension is a measure of the surface area that can absorb the nutrients and get it into our bloodstream. It's important that we don't have to have bellies that are football fields long to digest our everyday foods. If I had one area, this length. And in that area, I put one plasma membrane here, or I could choose in the same area to create a membrane that has all of these twists and turns. Although it's in the same relative area, the surface area or the full surface of all of these extensions is increased multiple times. And that's what essentially the microvilli does, is it increases that absorptive surface area by allowing this plasma membrane to be relatively compact and condensed in space. Not the same as microvilli, but again, sometimes misidentified are cilia. Cilia are generally hair-like extensions and not necessarily finger-like extensions, though I don't know that that matters when you're looking under a microscope. The hair-like extensions here are going to be used in the movement of a cell. So we don't generally think of cells as crawling along something, and in some cases they do, but very often cells are existing in water. Remember that all around the cell is the interstitial space. Inside that water, they use the cilia if so equipped, as these hair-like extensions to create a wave around the cell, and they beat in a specific unison that allows the cell to rotate, to travel along a distance, as long as it's moving in a place like water.
The flagella we really have as the best example in the tails of sperm. The tails in sperm cell are very tightly wound protein structures that will release energy and allow this cell to propel itself fast over great distances, just relying on the flagella. If it had to rely on the hair-like extensions of the cilia, it would be a very slow-moving cell and not necessarily useful for copulation. So the flagella best exemplified as a tail of the sperm. The final organelle of our discussion is the nucleus, and the nucleus can be broken down into subsections, but we don't need to review that just yet. We will just highlight that we have the nuclear membrane, the nucleus, and the nucleolus. Now those structures all together hold all of the genetic code for that cell, and that genetic code is in 46 chromosomes bound up in DNA. The DNA is the genetic code that dictates how this cell does what it does, how it repairs itself and uses the products that it has coming into it, and must be maintained for the cell to divide without creating mutations. So we've talked about our cell structure, the organelles within the cells, and how all of that gives rise essentially to a cell being repaired and able to do its basic functions of protein synthesis, lipid synthesis, getting rid of waste, dealing with creating energy out of basic components, and cell division. But now let's look at how a cell works when it's sitting in that space that we mentioned earlier in the interstitial fluid. So there's some things that go into the plasma membrane. The plasma membrane is known as a semi-permeable membrane. Permeable is referring to the idea that something is allowing a substance to cross over a barrier between two or more cavities. In our case, we can say right now it's the interstitial space into the intracellular space. The plasma membrane is the semi-permeable membrane, but the semi-portion means that only select things can make their way through the membrane. So we've already identified that water doesn't necessarily freely move through that plasma membrane without some channels and pores allowing it to do so. And then there's some basic small molecules and ions that can do the same. What's not allowed, though, are really big molecules like glucose, for instance. And you know this as an EMT, given the idea that glucose requires insulin to open up a channel for glucose to enter a cell that is usually closed. And so in that case, this would be a non-permeable membrane to glucose when we talk about our general plasma membranes. So then if we identify that certain things can be in the cell and certain things need to stay outside of the cell, and things that are in the cell go through at a very specific rate in which the concentration of the cytosol is different specifically than the concentration of the interstitial fluid, then we have to identify what can and can't move through the cells and how do they do so. So let's go through that by looking at the three different types of movement of things in cells in simplicity. So when we look at the different ways that things can get in and out of cells, we're identifying primarily first, is this passive or active transport? And it is a transport process, and when something is transported across the cell, passive transport means that there wasn't an actual expenditure of energy in doing so, and active transport did use energy. Now, to understand how passive transport gets things in and out of the cell without using energy, we have to understand the concentration gradient. A concentration gradient is to say that we have our semi-permeable membrane. Here it is. We have something that's intracellular, and we've got some fluid that's interstitial or extracellular. Now, the membrane itself, noted here, is semi-permeable to certain things. Let's say that we're talking about the permeability of sodium. Sodium is a very common ion used in many processes of the human body that are relative to EMS. If we look at sodium as an ion, sodium has a concentration in one concentration of sodium, and the brackets generally refer to concentration, we're talking about the ion. One concentration that's on the inside of the cell and another number concentration that's on the outside of the cell. And we saw that uh, as an example in the table we showed describing how different ions have concentrations inside the blood and inside the cytosol. So we talk about a concentration gradient. The concentration gradient is the difference between these two values. So if we said that this was a value of 10, 
and this was a value of 5, then we have a, concentrate, a concentration gradient on both sides of this membrane. And there's a rule that follows these concentration gradients. When we're talking about most chemicals and moving across the barriers that rely on passive tr transportation, the concentration gradients are always going to move from areas of high concentration to areas of low concentration. So I have a little bit of an analogy for us that doesn't fully work in all of these cases, but if you understand this concept with gravity as our force for our concentration gradient, then you'll understand how high to low would work. Let's say that I've got a building or a hill, here's my building, and on top of the building there's a water tower, just like you might see in a big city. Up here I've got a tank that's a little low on water. The building uses gravity to take water from the water tank to feed our toilet, our sink, and other structures inside the house. So gravity takes the concentration of water being higher here and the gravitational forces pulling it down from an area of high concentration of water to low concentration of water and in areas of gravity pulling it forcefully down towards the earth. Now let's think about for a second getting the water up into the tank. Now, it's probably not often that you would see a helicopter doing an airdrop and dropping water into the tank. So water has to be pumped up to this tank from the ground. So our water is down here in pipes. So in order to get the water up, it would be moving against the concentration gradient where water is here. And if we're saying that gravity is our gradient, then it would be moving against gravity. So to move this against gravity, gravity was pulling this down with no energy required on our part, we have to expend energy to go in the opposite direction. So in order to get water from here to our water tank, we'd have to use a pump. There are no pumps that work in this fashion without the expenditure of some type of energy. That might be something like electricity, that could be gas, creating some uh, driving force, mechanically moving a pump, or it might just be good old-fashioned human energy. Pumping a pump like you would a bicycle pump or a water pump with the same design would get water from the bottom to the top, but we'd have to expend it your energy. There would never be a case in which a human on Earth trying to pump against gravity would use something other than energy to get the fluid to the top. So if that makes sense to you, then realize that we're talking about the same thing. In this case, here, for whatever purposes, uh, and this does change in different cellular processes, but let's just stick with it. Let's just say that I have a concentration of 10 of these sodium ions inside the cell and five of these sodium ions outside the cell. If I want to move the sodium ions that are inside the cell to the outside, I just have to open a door. Because if I open a door, there's a higher concentration of sodium here and lower here. So sodium will naturally go from areas of high concentration to an area of low concentration, just without an expenditure of energy, because that's the natural tendency. If, however, I wanted to move three of these five sodiums, Here's our three, and I wanted to get 13 to the inside. I'd have to use energy because I'm going from low concentration to high concentration. So this would not be a passive process. So when we look at any situation in which we're discussing whether something is moving according to active transport or passive transport, the first question to ask is what's the concentration gradient? The second question to ask is, am I following a concentration gradient? Because if you are following a concentration gradient, it will always move from areas of high concentration to low concentration without the expenditure of energy. So I left out these three terms here, so let's review them. These are descriptions of how things move in and out of cells based on the thing and assuming that it's passive transport. So if we talk about osmosis first, osmosis is the movement of good old H2O. Reverse osmosis uses the process of osmosis in reverse to get clean water. So H2O, if H2O is the thing we're talking about moving, then that is osmosis. If we're talking about most other things moving, and it's not water, but maybe we're talking about salt inside H2O, if just the salt moves, then it's diffusion. 
Filtration is when we have pressures in addition to this that allow for the concentration using pressure to get something to go across the barrier. And a lot of times this pressure may just be because one area has less fluid on it than the other side. The best example in EMS for filtration for our concern will be in two places. One will be filtration that occurs inside our lymph system. The lymph system is essentially our drainage system, if you'd like to think of it, and then our urinary tract or a renal system. The renal system gets rid of fluid waste and the lymph is going to process unrefined waste that has fluid and other stuff inside of it. And hopefully before we get the lymph to the urinary tract, we've taken the other stuff out so that primary small chemicals and just water can be used in the urinary process. So to rehash that, if we're talking passive transport, we're talking about something that's likely moving across a concentration gradient or down from higher concentration to lower concentration, doesn't expend energy. But if we have to expend energy, we move into active transport. So let's look at something like diffusion. Remember, this is passive transport. And if we're talking about diffusion, we're talking about in the human body, water with a solution in it. But when we're talking about the movement of diffusion, it's the stuff that's in water and not the water itself. If the water moves, that would be osmosis. So in diffusion, and we talk about this extensively for electrolytes uh, and fluid balance in the human body, when we're talking about diffusion, we're very often talking about some basic chemical as it scatters through. Although we've talked about a very basic chemical, sodium, for example, we're actually going to talk a little bit about a larger chemical, glucose. So in this diagram, I want you to identify that on the side here, A versus B, the thing that's separating the two is time. Okay, so this is the same container moving from position A to the change in the same container being position B. That's how I'll refer to it. In position A, we just started. So we have one container that has water inside of it. It has a semi-permeable membrane. The semi-permeable membrane is separating, separating the left and right sides. On the creation of this bottle and the membrane, we poured 20% glucose onto one side and 10% glucose on the other side, meaning there's twice as much glucose on the right side as there is 10% or half as much glucose on the left side. Both are sitting in water. So first we'll talk about diffusion, and then in the same picture we can talk about osmosis. So let's talk about glucose first, because if we're talking about water movement, it's osmosis. If we're talking about other th things than water, we're talking about diffusion. So let's say that this membrane freely allows both the movement of water and glucose to go through it. Just natural tendencies and natural concentration gradients. We have a concentration of glucose that's higher on this side than it is on the left side. So glucose is freely going to move in concentrations from the high side to the low side until we reach a point of equilibrium on which both sides are equal. So that's the diffusion gradient. So diffusion we can show in this picture. Diffusion works this way. But let's look at water and osmosis. If we talk about water, water with stuff in it has, if the space is confined, if water has stuff in it on one side of a container and on the other side of that container with a semi-permeable membrane to water on the middle, if the other side of the container has less stuff in it, then it will have more water. If there's more stuff in a side of this container, it will have less water. So the stuff in this case is glucose. So on the right side, we see that we have less water than on the left side. The left side has less stuff, so it has more water. The right side has more stuff, so it has less water. So the water then is able to move freely to help meet this goal of our concentration gradient. So our osmosis diffusion gradient is moving the opposite direction. Water is moving from where it's most abundant, here on the side of the 10% glucose, to where it is le least abundant, here on the 20% glucose side, or the right side of this picture. Now, over time, assuming that these were semi-permeable membranes to both substances, at the end of the diffusion process, we'd meet equilibrium, in which both sides are, you guessed it, equal. Equilibrium has resulted because 
the concentration gradient cannot move past equilibrium. So if we're at equilibrium, there is neither a point of one side being smaller or higher concentration than the other. They're both equal. If things are equal, there's no incentive for these molecules to move any further because they've equalized themselves and dispersed themselves equally in the space that was provided for them. Also, water has reached equilibrium, as did the glucose. So when we had our diagram on this side, if it was 20% glucose, it was 80% water. If this was 10% glucose, it was 10%, I'm sorry, 90% water. Now that we have 15% glucose on either side, we have 85% water on either side. So now we've reached equilibrium. So remember that in all these cases of passive transport, things will move from higher concentration to lower concentration. Filtration is a little bit different, and it can be the movement of water or small particles passing through a membrane, but usually using something like pressure. When we talk about something like hydrostatic pressure, what we're really talking about is the pressure of water. And this is important in the human body because water is the solution that makes up almost all of our cells. Urine formation happens in this way, in which we have more water pressure on one side of the body than on the other side of the body's membrane into the renal system. So your kidneys process urine and they do so by having a pressure inside the blood that has water and other solution components inside of it. The pressure is higher on the side of the blood than it is on the side of urine. So given that things move from high pressure to low pressure, just like they do from high concentration to low concentration, we're going to find that water or other solutions will make their way across this barrier as long as they're moving in that direction. Let's say that somebody's kidneys backed up. If the pressure inside the kidneys became greater than the pressure inside the blood, then we would have a serious problem because stuff would move from the kidneys back into the bloodstream. And in that situation, we're most likely to experience a patient that's going to have some form of disease process that has resulted in the pressure change. And again, that didn't happen likely overnight. And or if it did, it would be a very dramatic change for the body. But because the pressure gradient would be opposite, it would still follow high pressure to low pressure. It would just move the opposite direction. So it isn't a violation of our law that diffusion always moves from areas of higher concentration to lower concentration. If we had some type of chemical dispersed into a room, for example, and it was a gas, if the chemical was dispersed into an open room and could freely move across that room, when it was initially dispersed, we had to maybe take it in in a package, in a container, a bottle. Once we open the bottle, though, let's say that this is a bottle of soda, inside the bottle, we had CO2 molecules. That gave us are bubbles and fizz. But you know that as soon as you open a bottle of soda and you leave it open, the gases are going to escape and make your soda flat. It becomes flat because CO2 has entered our atmosphere and CO2 will preference to spread itself out if it has enough space, just like many gases. So spreading itself out has changed the concentration of that CO2 in both containers. The concentration in the room of CO2 was less, even if it's just a small amount, the concentration of CO2 in the room was less than it was inside the bottle. But once opened, CO2 dispersed itself and eventually will get equilibrium. Equilibrium in this case would equal flat soda. The soda carbonation comes from carbon dioxide. So semi-permeable membranes, as we've discussed before, are membranes that allow some things to go through, but others aren't allowed to go through. And each cell will have, and tissue type, may have variable types of permeability depending on that cell's function. So we're gonna have to look at different tissues and different cells in different situations to determine what cells are permeable to. Now, on the other hand, opposite of passive transport, where we don't expend energy and things go from high concentration to low concentration naturally, we have active transport. Active transport is the complete opposite, in which we've used ATP as a source of energy to go up the concentration gradient. Notice we said down before. So this is moving against the concentration gradient. So now let's use water again. Let's say that we have a stream. 
here's our stream. The stream has water flowing and it's flowing in this direction. If you wanted to just cruise the stream and go from this point A to point B, all you have to do is jump into a raft or some type of boat and you'll travel with the current as it takes you down through the river to point B. Didn't have to expend many, much energy because the concentration gradient was probably gravity making its movement through this water in the shape of hills and valleys. Maybe even if we don't see them at the microscopic point that we're viewing. But if you had to get from point B to point A, and the river was moving in the opposite direction from point A to point B, you would have to expend energy. And in your boat, you might have to have a paddle to paddle up using human energy or a motor to expend chemical energy to get you from point B to point A. A. That chemical energy for us is always going to be ATP or adenosine triphosphate. We'll talk more about ATP and adenosine triphosphate a little bit later. Just know right now that it is actually the product of mitochondrial metabolism and is the piece of the puzzle that allows our cells to do work. So let's use our first example of something pumping something against the gradient. So remember when we talked about water going down from the top of the building to the bottom floor of the building and vice versa, we had to go against gravity to get water all the way to the top. We had to pump it out. So we use pumps to do things like move something against the concentration gradient or against gravity if that's what we're using our, as our example. One of the most important pumps in the human body for our purpose is the sodium potassium pump. The sodium potassium pump is a really interesting structure within cells. Now remember that this is going to be active transport. So when we have to move things against the concentration gradient, we expend ATP as the energy. So in some cases though, there are other means of moving things against gradients. Bulk transport and sometimes phagocytosis and pinocytosis or a cell eating and a cell drinking can be examples of that energy expenditure. But let's look specifically at sodium potassium because we're going to be using this as our first example of tissue when we talk about the nervous system and how cells depolarize and repolarize. As you can imagine, that's very important for neural function, but it's the exact same process that occurs with a slight modification by adding some chemicals that occurs in muscle and in cardiac tissue. So we have here on this picture a diagram that shows the movement that occurs as a sodium potassium pump does its work. So first we'll say that the outside of the cell is interstitial fluid the extracellular space or extra outside of the cell. And this is intracellular or cytosol. Inside of the cell, there becomes a need for us to move potassium and sodium so that they are built up in abnormal concentrations outside of the cell versus inside of the cell. If we had just no pump and just pores, then eventually sodium and potassium would become equalized and the cell would reach equilibrium. That's bad because we want to get something out of this cell, which is essentially a form of work. And if we want to do that, we need to build up an artificial gradient so that we don't reach equilibrium. So we do that by pumping sodium and potassium out. There's something that's worth noting here. So what we're going to see here later on in our cells is that sodium and potassium move in such a way that cells will have a different electrochemical charge on the outside of the cell than they do on the inside of the cell. That difference is going to be a difference in positive and negative charges. So when we build that difference up, I have to get out of the way so that it doesn't confuse you and leave you with more questions. How is it that two positively charged ions moving in and out of the cell will result in different charges, positive and negative? None of these two ions, potassium here nor sodium here, are negatively charged. So how do we ever get a negative charge on one side of the cell? Well, it's not necessarily the individual ions that create this charge. It's the ions together in the right concentration that create this charge. So simply, let's look at the movement here. The sodium potassium pump is going to use its energy to take three sodium ions with a charge of three positive together, 
all together, three positive, and pump them out of the cell. So we end up with three positive charges on the outside of the cell if we're looking part for part. When the three cell, three pot sodium rather ions move out of the cell, potassium moves into the cell, but only two potassium ions move into the cell. So the inside of the cell is two positive. That gives us a difference of negative one. That's our negative charge. Because two positive charges have moved into the cell, for every three positive charges that move out of the cell, we have a change in the gradient between this membrane our semi-permeable membrane of the plasma membrane, we have a difference of a net negative one charge. So that gives us later, when we discuss it, a positive and negative charge. So I want you to start memorizing that now as you work with the sodium potassium pump. So the sodium potassium pump uses energy to take three potassium and two, let me reverse that, to take three sodium and two potassium and move them to opposite areas. And in doing so, by taking uh, sodium out of the inside of the cell and putting pass potassium onto the inside of the cell, we've effectively created an artificial gradient in which there's more sodium on the outside of the cell than there is potassium on the inside. And there's more potassium on the inside of the cell than there is on the outside of the cell. And so these two things have built up artificial gradients of sodium and artificial gradients of potassium. Now the concentration will be larger on the outside of the cell for sodium. So sodium, when given the opportunity, will rush into the cell. But for potassium, the difference is also, although it's only two relative to the three, there's more potassium on the inside of the cell after this is done. So there's a high concentration of potassium on the inside of the cell. So potassium, when it gets its opportunity, will move to the outside of the cell where there's less potassium. So let's restate that. Our sodium potassium pumps works in a way in which sodium is pumped in three sodium ions to the outside of the cell from inside and potassium two ions pumped from the outside of the cell to the inside. There's more sodium built up on the outside of the cell than there is sodium on the inside of the cell. There's more potassium on the inside of the cell than there is on the outside of the cell. And there's a net difference of one negative charge. And so we build a high concentration of sodium on the outside of the cell and a high concentration of potassium on the inside of the cell. When given the opportunity, sodium will rush from outside the cell to inside the cell because there's more on the outside than the inside and potassium will rust from the inside to the outside. So I hope that makes sense because this is foundational to understanding later on, a little bit later on, but later on understanding cardiac physiology. Some terms for us and how cells can move things like food or take in fluids like essentially drinking if there was such a thing, but phagocytosis refers to the process of eating something. So a, a phagocyte is going to be a cell that eats things. And we see that exemplified in our immune system. We have white blood cells that are specifically phagocytes that will eat bacterial cells and break them down on the inside of the cell so they're not left to do damage in other places. Let's talk now, zooming out a little bit from cells and how they move things across their membranes, of which we'll talk much more about later. And now talk about how cells change their structure and amount of cells within tissue. So we've got a few terms here. We've got hyperplasia and anaplasia. And as you know, hyper generally refers to more of something hyper. And ana usually means some type of abnormal or often un without. In the term of anaplasia, we have abnormal, undifferentiated cells, and sometimes that can be a problem like a sign of a tumor. When we have hyperplasia in tissue, we increase cell reproduction, and generally that leads to more cells within tissue, and tissue gets larger. 
And a good example of how cells create hyperplasia is by looking at this person's body as a bodybuilder. The person, will assume, didn't start off looking like this. They had to build more muscle in order to get the muscle that we see developed in this picture. So this person has hyperplasic tissue, but it's in the muscles. And we probably would say that for most purposes, that's probably fine and healthy depending on how they got to that point. But hyperplasic tissue is not always healthy. And in the case of the heart, which is a muscle, when it has hypertrophy or the size of that tissue got larger, hypertrophy, we can end up with a larger ventricle that actually isn't stronger than it was before. And in fact, when we talk about something like congestive heart failure, very often congestive heart failure is because of hypertrophy of a ventricle. And most often in this case, the left ventricle. Here's the normal heart. Here's a heart that has left ventricular hypertrophy. And here's a heart that is now in failure because the volume of this ventricle got larger, but the size of the muscle tissue never actually compensated for the volume of fluid that's in that space. This leads to weak ejection and perhaps backflow of blood into the lungs. Now we can zoom out even further, and we've covered the basic ideas that are involved in cells, of which we'll discuss very specifically as we approach different types of organs. So now let's look at how cells come together to create tissues. So in this review, I'm only going to cover the highlights of these different types of tissue, but it is important that as you memorize and prepare to move forward in your curriculum that you've identified the subgroups of these types of tissues. There's four major cl classifications. The epithelial tissue, which is a large concentration of the tissue in our body's classification. We also have connective tissue, which also makes up a lot of the tissue in our body. Muscle, which will break down into three different sections, and nervous tissue, which will break down into two sections, but furthermore later. Let's start with epithelial tissue. Epithelial tissue has one of the most complex ways of naming tissue that any of the types of tissue have, and so we want to identify that. But if you can visualize the terms, you'll be able to identify visually the type of tissue that you're looking at. Now again, it's not likely that you're pulling this tissue out, looking at it under a microscope as a slide, but it does drive home by looking at it almost as a slide in histo histology. It does make it very easy to identify the type of tissue that we're talking about. So the first thing to identify in epithelial tissue is what is the cell shape? And then we're going to look at how is the cell attached to other tissue? So the cell shape starts with squamous and think squashed, right? Squashed flat cells, cuboidal, pretty straightforward and columnar. Now we modify that term by adding simple or stratified depending on how many layers we have. If we have one layer, then it's the simplest form. It's, it's the simplest form, it's very simple. It's just one layer. So we could say this is simple flat tissue, simple squamous, simple cuboidal, and simple columnar. And then we have something that's a transition between the simple and stratified but can very easily be misidentified. It really is actually just simple in its shape. But this comes from types of cells in which the type of cell is bunched together in one position, but each cell, this is how we get to that idea that it's simple, each cell actually connects to the basement membrane. So if we look at all of these cells, if we trace them all down, they all connect to the basement membrane. Even though it looks like multiple layers, if they all connect to the basement membrane, then they're all one layer. Now, the transitional state here is a transition of stratified. So we have multiple layers. Stratified squamous is an example of the type of tissue we might see in skin. Transitional tissue. And transitional tissue is actually stratified and not pseudo-stratified as we saw down here because in either the transitional relaxed or the transitional stretched, not all of the cells will touch the basement membrane. That's a key to determining stratified versus simple. If all the cells touch the basement membrane, even though they appear to not do so, then they're simple. If the cells include cells that don't touch the basement membrane, then they would be stratified. The difference between the relaxed and the stretched here is really that 
if we have this tissue in, say, the bladder, when the bladder is empty and everything is relaxed or not stretched, then all the cell tissue gets thicker and bunched up upon each other. But it's the same tissue. If we stretch that bladder out when it gets full, it's the same tissue, but it appear, appears flatter because these things are bunched closer together as the outer diameter of the bladder stretches out when it becomes full of urine. Epithelial tissue is important in the membrane structure of most of our organs. So when we talk about membranes, membranes are usually some type of tissue that lines some cavity, organ, or the internal lumen of some diameter, like a blood vessel. So when we're talking about these things, that's very often where they're found. If you find that there's a membranous cellular tissue, it's probably epithelial tissue in its origin. When we talk about tissue types and we identify squamous cuboidal columnar versus simple pseudostratified and stratified, what you want to do is pair each of these terms through further reading with the type of tissue that you might find in an example of an organ. So be able to say, for example, if we're talking about something like a stratified layer of squamous tissue, we're talking about something like the skin or protective lining that has multiple cells, some of them giving their life, if you will, for the cells below them in the process of things like eating, drinking, and protection from the outside world. In each of these areas, I'll let you review the slide so that you can see the example of that location. But the function does tell us a little bit about where they're going to be and vice versa, where they are will tell us a little bit about each function. This is a drawing on the right-hand side and an actual microscope slide of the tissue on the left hand side identifying how these tissues come together and create the structures that we're aware of. I should highlight that uh, although I made a mistake here and covered up some of my text, what we're really talking about here is basically the degree of axial stretching or stretching along this axis. Now, in the previous slides that showed epithelial tissue, we did see basement membranes, and many of the basement membranes are attached to connective tissue. Connective tissue is one of the most abundantly distributed tissues, and it's containing some type of connection or matrix that builds it up. An important note in this list, and you should identify each of these types and be able to give an example of where they're found. In this list, we do have a type of liquid matrix. So this does mean that blood in total makes up its own type of tissue when we're dividing tissue types. Blood is a liquid matrix and really we would know that because if we just think about the process of bleeding, very simply the process of bleeding, if we have a cut we know that there's a matrix that's created. Even if we don't know much about the matrix, we know there's a matrix that's created that traps red blood cells and will eventually create a clot and hopefully a scab that prevents bleeding from occurring over the long term. Because of that, the matrix that's within that process is involved in the tissue that becomes blood. So don't forget that there is a liquid matrix that falls within the connective tissue subtype. We'll talk about each of these types briefly in the future slides.
Areolar tissue is the type of tissue that's used as a packing material, and it's commonly used in three types of fibers, elastin, collagen, and reticulum. So generally when we think of skin and we talk about uh, the aging process of skin, areolar tissue is part of that process. Adipose tissue is fat tissue. Fats have a couple different functions associated with them. We probably think of the insulation support that fat provides, but it's also a good source of secondary energy and energy and nutrient storage for later use. It can be used as a site of energy if we have to back up from using a depleted supply of carbohydrates. Fat also, as its energy storing capacity, can hold on to nutrients and medications over a long period of time. So some patients may have some medication built up in their fat stores that's released periodically as they go out through the day, depending on the characteristics of that fat, the characteristics of the pharmacology of the drug, and finally, how much fat the person has and how quickly they use it. Fibrous connective tissue is one of the most commonly referenced and probably the most commonly thought of type of connective tissue. So it involves the tissue that makes up our tendons, ligaments, and then apneuroses are essentially flat sheets of tendons as exemplified, for example, in the feet. This is a picture of adipose tissue and dense fibrous connective tissue. You can see that we have our adipose cell tissue structures with a very small area with plasma membrane and a nucleus, and then an entire area devoted to the storage of fat, where lipids will be stored for later use. Then we also have our fiber and collagen, collagen, our fiber and collagenous fibers. Then we have our fibrous and collagenous. Then we have our fibrous tissue shown in this slide. Cartilage is within this category as it does make up a matrix when we're children, when we're fetuses, and eventually still in parts of our body as we become adults. The structure of cartilage is that it is not as rigid as bone, provides more flexibility, but an important note in cartilage is that cartilage does not actually have, in most cartilage, does not actually have blood vessels that supply the inside of the cartilage, the deep inner portion of cartilage tissue, with oxygen and nutrients. And so cartilage relies on diffusion to get those things from the outside of the cartilage blood vessels to the inside of the cartilage where there are no blood vessels. Bone makes up its own classification, and yes, some cartilage does eventually turn into bone through the process of ossification. Bone functions, as you probably identify, as our structure and protection for our body in the skeleton, but it's also a means of regulating the amount of calcium and as a source of blood cell production for the duration of our lives. This is a picture on one side of the osteon involved in the calcified structure of the bone. And on the right side, we have a chondrocyte in one of the structures within an osteon. Blood, as we identified, is a liquid matrix and has things within the blood that are soluble proteins that can do things like be activated during clotting, but also serves as a conduit for transporting nutrients, oxygen, and getting rid of waste. In this picture, we have the matrix, which is the fluid of the blood. In this case, it's plasma. We have a white blood cell that's actually purple here, and the pale red colored cells are red blood cells within this fluid. Muscle tissue is not one of the connective tissue types, so the previous slide wrapped that up for us. Muscle tissue has its own subclassifications, and muscle is one of the four major classifications of all tissue. The classifications of muscle tissue involve some separations in both visual and the way that the cells work when we're looking at these cells and organs. Skeletal cells are the cells that are associated with bone, and they're described precisely in the movement that we have of bones and joints. Cardiac tissue is muscle, but in comparison to skeletal tissue, of which I made a mistake and misspelled here, when we're talking about skeletal muscle, skeletal muscle has striations in it, in which we'll see that in the next slide, and it is voluntarily controlled. You make the decision as to when you move. 
Cardiac tissue is not voluntarily controlled, but still has striations. There is another difference in cardiac tissue in that, although it's involuntary and has striations, it also has a tight junction between cells that skeletal muscles do not have. Smooth muscle is involuntary, but lacks striations, so it doesn't look like the striated skeletal or cardiac tissue, and because it doesn't have striations or lines, it appears smooth. Here we can see smooth muscle, Nervous tissue is broken up into two categories, the things that are involved in conducting the nervous impulses, called neurons, and everything else. All the other structures that are involved in the central, peripheral, brain, and spinal column, all of those nervous system tissues are a mix of neurons and glial cells. Glial cells are all the supportive cells that support the function of neurons. Neurons have two primary portions to their overall structure, dendrites and axons. There are further structures we'll talk about when we talk about the nervous system later. Dendrites are going to generally conduct impulse towards the body of the cell, and axons are going to conduct an impulse away from the body of a cell. Here's a nervous tissue in which we can see the nerve cell body, also known as the soma, right here. We can see some extensions. The length of dendrites and axons can be quite long and quite short and variable in between. But the dendrites and axons are going to help connect these neurons together. And those connections give rise to our ability to function as mammals, our ability to think as human beings, and the ability to do the, all the amazing things that we're capable of. The connections themselves create our unique thought process, emotions, identity, and memories, and our abilities as individuals. A last note on tissues as we identify tissues just very superficially is that tissue repair is variable depending on the type of tissue. You probably already know that when we're talking about tissues like muscle and nervous tissue, nervous tissue, especially nervous tissue, it's very difficult for some of that tissue to repair itself if it's damaged or dies. But epithelial and connective tissue can generally regenerate very easily compared to, say, nervous tissue and muscle. To wrap up our lecture, we'll talk about chapter five in the textbook that we use in class, organ systems. Remember that cells come together to create tissue, tissue comes together to create organs, organs come together to create organ systems, and the organ systems come together to create an organism. So organs are basically structures made up of two or more types of tissues that have independent qualities, but together create a complex function that's more difficult to create than on its own. Organ systems are collections of organs that have come together to create a system that works together to meet some goal, and all the organ systems come together to create the organism. There is not really much difference in what people consider organs, but there are some differences in which types of organ systems we list. In emergency medicine, it's very common for us to divide this into 9, 10, or 11 body systems. Here I've expanded out for the purposes of our lecture. We'll talk about each independently for the human body lecture. I've expanded out each system, so we've made 11 body systems. But if we were to separate this uh, or further divide this into 10 body systems, generally we would end up with musculoskeletal musculoskeletal system as being one system as opposed to two, and that would give us our 10 body systems. So keep that in mind. If you're serving an exam and it asks, what are the body systems? If you've used a textbook that has 11 body systems in which the skeletal and muscular systems are separate, then that's the difference. If it's 10, then the muscular and skeletal systems are together considered the same body system. They work very closely together. And I think when we talk about medicine, we talk about pharmacology, we talk about our treatment, including splinting, for example, we generally mix these two things together. But when we're talking about their individual functions in anatomy and physiology, it's best that we separate them apart. So let's go through each system and talk about its major function and big highlights of each system. When we talk about the integumentary system, and that's where we'll start in our discussion of the 11 body systems for this lecture, we we're talking about really one a very unique organ in which the organ of the integumentary system, the skin, is the 
largest organ of the body. The skin is continuous all the way throughout the body and then connects with our mucous membranes in the mouth, the genitals, and in our rectum. So our GI tract very often is epithelial tissue just as our skin is epithelial tissue. In fact, we should think about our GI tract as being a tube that passes through the center of us but is distinctly separate from the inside of our body where, say, we have blood, blood vessels, and other organs. That separation is important because we want to make sure that we can understand later in the GI tract how is it that we can have beneficial bacteria on the inside of our GI tract that if it gets into our bloodstream, for example, is quite detrimental. The integument is also going to be responsible for a few roles. It's going to serve as a protective barrier. So it can protect from the loss of fluid and electrolytes. It's going to protect us from infection from physical injury and trauma, and from ambient temperatures. The skeletal system, again, if we're speaking of it as a distinct system from the muscular system, the skeletal system is made up of many parts. We're not going to memorize all of the bones of the human body in this process, but we will identify the bones on this slide and a few other structures of bone. Understanding how bone works is very important to understanding how we develop blood and blood cells within our bloodstream, our immune system, and the rest of our body. The skeletal system would then be responsible for protection. For instance, the ribs protect our thoracic organs. It will be responsible for movement and it will store a few key components to life. The muscular system is generally in these purposes talking about the skeletal muscular system, although we will talk about things like involuntary muscle and cardiac muscle, but we do so separate from skeletal muscle. So if we're talking about the skeletal muscle system, it serves also a few roles. One, it's going to serve as some form of protection as well. Not as efficiently as bone pro provides protection, and in some cases even fat, but still protection nonetheless. Think of your abdomen, for example, lacking bone, but still has some protection with muscle and fat. It's also going to be responsible for heat production. The mechanism of shivering, as we talked about in earlier lectures, involves the negative feedback loop of thermodynamics. And in the process of shivering, you're creating heat when you're trying to warm your core body temperature because ambient temperature and or your core temperature is starting to decrease. In addition, obviously, we get movement from the function of skeletal muscle. The nervous system is going to be broken down into two primary structures. We have the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. The central nervous system, as is highlighted here in the green color, is going to involve the brain and the spinal cord. And all other systems, not specifically the brain and spinal cord, although attached to it, will be considered the peripheral nervous system. This is our electrical or electrochemical messenger. The endocrine system complements our nervous system by being an exclusive chemical messenger system using hormones. These are responsible for all functions of our body, including, to some degree, the process of aging. The cardiovascular system here is going to bring into play both the cardio, the heart, and the vascular systems. So there's essentially two systems here if we'd want to talk about it, but most of us books are going to talk about them as one. The cardiovascular system obviously is responsible for transporting nutrients, getting rid of waste, and carrying oxygen to the core organs as they need them. The lymphatic and immune systems are going to be combined in this lecture, and we'll talk about lymph as our waste disposing system and the immune system as closely tied. When we say waste, we mean some cells that are broken down that are from our body that have to get rid of. But we also mean in the immune system process, we mean cells that have been attacking our other cells that we've broken down and need to get rid of without infecting the whole body. If we didn't have the lymphatic system 
system separate from the cardiovascular system, then we wouldn't have these little areas for collection in the lymph nodes that keep things from spreading through other regions. Because our cardiovascular system does not have these little areas called lymph nodes, then a infection here hitching a ride in the cardiovascular system can very easily make its way to the heart and other structures of the body, which may prove fatal. Our respiratory system is one of the areas, or one of the big three rather, of emergency medicine. You've probably already reviewed a great deal of the respiratory system at the EMT level, and we're going to expand upon that to a degree. But the respiratory tract, for the most part, being a basic, gives you most of the pearls you need to be successful as a paramedic. The digestive system is going to be our nutrient absorbing system and a means of us processing the leftover portions of nutrient waste. The urinary system helps to decrease our blood pressure in one of its mechanisms by getting rid of fluid when it's more abundant than it should be, and it's going to clean our blood or get rid of fluid and very small based waste. The male and the female reproductive systems come together for our reproductive system within our lecture, although we'll talk about each individual reproductive system. They'll be in the same lecture because they share some unique characteristics that are not shared between other systems. I know that was a brief overview and maybe a little bit more depth than you were hoping for, and to some of you, less depth than you were hoping for. If you're looking for more depth or you're curious about how these systems work, please visit some of our other videos as we produce them. Thanks.